Hello. Mary, you are audible and vi visible also. So if the no, uh, don't don't talk, don't talk.
मयूरी सर हैव जॉइंड गुड मॉर्निंग सर हेलो जस्ट वेट प्लीज यस सर प्लीज पुट योर वीडियो ऑन सर या आई विल डू दैट जस्ट वेट प्लीज इज दैट ओके नाउ कैन यू हियर मी गुड मॉर्निंग सर हां वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल एंड थैंक यू फॉर ज्वाइनिंग टूडेज वेबिनार I, Mayuri Gupta, take this opportunity to welcome you all on behalf of Vitaasan International Business School on this virtual platform for interaction with Honorable Justice Mr. Patel Kumar. Before we proceed further, let us take blessings of Lord Ganesha for peace and prosperity.
International Business School established in the year 2004. GIP is affiliated to Guru Gobind Singh Enterprise University, Delhi. Center for Legal Studies, GIP, conducts law courses of BBA, LLB, and BA, LLB, approved by Bar Council of India, and management courses by All India Council for Technical Education, Ministry of Entirety, and Government of India. The institute is accredited as Category A by National Assessment and Accreditation Council and assessed as Category A plus by CFP Regulatory Committee and rated highest A by Joint Inspection Committee of Government of NCT of Delhi and GGS IP University. The institute has been rated grade A by Academic Audit Cell of GGS IP University consecutively from past seven years. Yes, has also been rated number two by Times B School Survey 2018 and 19. The COVID-19 pandemic is creating significant health, social, economic, and legal challenges worldwide, forcing institutes and universities to shut their physical activities. We, as Center for Legal Studies, KIF, understand that navigating the pace of change dealing with immediate issues can only be developed to taking regular insight of the problem with the opinion of experts. The emergence of a novel coronavirus and its associated illness, COVID-19, has brought to light several challenges being faced by the Indian constitution during the pandemic. It is perhaps the first instance wherein the Indian constitutional fabric is being tested against an infectious disease of such scale and impact. Several debates have surfaced with respect to fundamental rights and duties, center-state relationships and federalism in India, PD justice, decentralization of power to local self-government, to name a few. In its perpetual pursuit to deliver existential learning and offer global exposure to legal fraternity, CLS GIF is very delighted to organize this webinar on pandemic and constitutional challenges, a current perspective. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's session, Honorable Justice Sri Swatantri Kumar. Sir has practiced law before joining the bench. In 1994, your lordship was appointed as additional judge of Delhi High Court. He was appointed as the Chief Justice of Bombay High Court in 2007 and was elevated as Judge of the Supreme Court in the year 2009. Sir was appointed as the chairperson of National Green Tribunal in 2012. He has been instrumental in delivering several landmark judgments, widening the horizon of environmental jurisprudence in India. He has received several awards for his contribution to law. Your Lordship, we welcome you. It is an honor to have you here with us. I request your Lordship to take the session forward and enlighten us all with expertise and wisdom. Over to you, sir. So, uh, Am I audible to you now? Yes, yes, sir. All right. Now, just uh, to share for what's the kind of time you people uh, have allocated to me for speaking so that I abide by the schedule. So, you can speak. So, we have no issue with it. Uh, we have uh, allotted an hour for you, but if you wish, you can speak further. We have a no, no, an hour is enough. Okay. Thank you. Well, firstly, let me <clears throat> really thank the management of the college, Professor Hoti, and faculty members, and all the attendees for having chosen this topic one. Secondly, trying to reach out to the students in this difficult period to create some awareness in relation to environment and secondly, to further their academic resource. So I think it's a big effort on the part of the management of the 
Institute and <clears throat> see the topic that we have for the deliberation for today is the pandemic and constitutional challenges of current perspective. Well, if we examine this on plain and simple principles of environmental jurisprudence, the constitutional jurisprudence per se comes into the play. There are four different aspects of this topic that we have. First is the pandemic. Now, pandemic itself has caused so much of damage not only to a specific region of the globe, but across the globe. Of course, we will deal with the challenges in its perspective a little later. This pandemic now itself has become a controversy whether it is human generated or it is environmental generated virus. We needn't go into that aspect of the matter. Fact of the matter is that it is a very serious virus world which probably as yet has not found its way to the healthcare science and has not provided. There have been serious casualties all over the world. In our country, it has affected the entire socio-economic values, it has impacted the environment, it has impacted the health, the casualties are pretty high, it has disturbed the human life. Now, does all this emanates from some rights that are vested in the citizens or it is a sheer understanding of people that there is difficulties or violation of their lifestyle which they were living. Well, under the Indian Constitution, we have the chapter on fundamental rights, chapter 3. And as you know, that fundamental rights are enforceable in law. Except Article 19, there is nothing that comes into play as far as COVID-19 is concerned. That is the right of movement, which has been restricted or limitation has been imposed by the authorities concerned and the state governments on the movement of people and restrictions on your coming out of your houses, which have been termed as lockdowns. But The main emphasis is on Article 21. See, Article 21 
is just a one line article which says that nobody can be deprived of his life and liberty without process established by law. Now kindly see that it is by judicial creativity and the judicial system of this country having realized that they need to expand jurisdiction, pronounced judgments from time to time, expanding the scope of Article 21 of the Constitution and putting in number of rights in that being the ancillary wings of the right or the fundamental right of right to life. The most important, of course, as you know, that education was one of the subjects that was introduced to Article 21. But that may come a little later. What you have to see is that the first and the foremost was that when we talk of right to life, does it mean animal existence? So the Supreme Court, in the case of Kharat Singh, had first clearly stated that when we talk of a right of right to life, it is not animal existence. It has to be a decent, proper right to life to give it a meaningful dimensions to this right. Then came Menka Gandhi's case, where the right of life, the Menka Gandhi versus Union of India, the right of right to life was expended and it was stated that it is not only negative of animal existence, but there has to be a positivity to this right and it should be to live with dignity. Then in Sunil Batra's case, the Supreme Court said that you can have full right as a fundamental right to protect your heritage, culture, and then finally, cumulative impact of all these rights was the last the Supreme Court pronounced on was right to decent and clean environment was a fundamental right. That was the expansion given to Article 21. And therefore, this comes up on a very high pedestal because, ladies and gentlemen, when we talk of freedoms under Article 19 of the Constitution, they automatically are subject to the restrictions that can be imposed by the legislature, by the competent authority, but in accordance with law. Now, in accordance with law means it must stand the test of rationality, reasonableness, doctrine of proportionality, and legislative competence. Once these essentials are filtered, and now the Supreme Court has added further saying that you should have some nexus or there should be proper restriction aim that must be satisfied the test of reasonableness. Now with this comes that the right to decent and clean environment being a fundamental right becomes an absolute right because under our constitution, Article 21 is sub not subject to limitations. Article 19, all the freedoms given, freedom of speech, expression, movement, trade, everything else 
that has been provided in the article 19 is subject to the restrictions and limitations that can be imposed by the process of law now restrictions when are imposed then naturally the there is a feeling of resentment in the people or the citizens who are entitled to the freedoms you can always and always impose restrictions and when you impose restrictions and you satisfy the tests which I have just mentioned and they have been laid down by the Supreme Court in various uh, cases, then you can now as of today, now coming back strictly now the one principle you should remember out of what has so far been mentioned that 19 is subject to restriction, Article 21 is an absolute right. And that is how the balance, constitutional balance, is to be taken care of. Now, what we have to see is that leave all this on the one side and work it out what kind of restrictions can be imposed. Now, COVID-19, as of today, you know, there are two main acts which have come into play. One is the epidemic, other is the migrant interstate migrant labor act, which is very much evoked today because of the situation created. Now, in the disaster management, in the epidemic act and the interstate act on movement of labor and rights and liabilities of the labor. These three have been invoked for the purposes of handling the crisis created out of COVID-19 as of today. Now they have created a lot of questions and the question which probably deserve to be considered with some sense of logic and now when we say that you would not move out of your house is obviously a restriction on your right to movement right freedom of movement now this will be reasonable and view have been taken that yes it is rational and in the interest of public larger public interest is sought to be achieved. Now the question of detaining interstate labors, as you know, there was a very serious issue in Karnataka where the people wanted to go to their homes, the interstate labor coming from other neighboring states. They wanted to leave. And first the decision was special trains were arranged and then the decision was taken that probably it may not be feasible for the reason that there could be economic consequences like if the whole labor leaves the entire work even if the Karnataka was open and removed the lockdown will it be not economic crisis so that again was a conflict between economic and social cause now we have to see that there are certain things that have happened and I would be sharing with you something at the towards the end of the talk but I just want to mention to you that let's see are there certain goods that have happened out of COVID-19 it's a very unfortunate very serious pandemic that has happened and it is in the process some people feel there is not very bright chances of its ending soon. Now what happens is now suddenly there has been a change in our lifestyles because of the restrictions imposed. Now those are, for example, if you see there is a greater hygiene consciousness. People have become very conscious of hygiene in day to day life. Second major item is treating with the waste, waste generation, segregation, disposal, carriage, 
and final blocking of the waste. And their entire thing has improved. Now, next is the traffic on the roads. Traffic on the roads, obviously, if you're not permitted to go, the traffic is reduced, but it has shown its positive impacts on environment. Then working from home. Your webinar is one of its examples that you can, without moving on the roads, without physical presence of all, you can have the benefit of technology to serve your academic ends or to have knowledge dispensation in the field of education. Now, see, these are the few things which has happened, which may be somewhat little positive as a result of a very negative and a damaging pandemic. Now, if these things are carried forward, so post COVID-19 also, probably there will be a greater health standards improvement in our cities, in our country. Obviously, it doesn't mean that you should shut down. But what you need to do is that the human interference with the natural resources should be checked. I will be showing you a kind of a video on River Ganga. How clean was it on 14th of April and 2020? And you could drink the water from the river sitting on the side of the river. Now that itself will reduce the water shortage, which we may be generating by this uh, event happening in the longer time. Therefore, there have been some positive environmental impacts. But you must not understand to say that the suggestion, either directly or indirectly, would be that there should be complete shutdown. No. Development must be there, industrial activities should be carried on, we should revert back, but there should be a very serious regulation of all these things. Why can't human beings stop throwing waste into the river? If river Yamuna can improve by itself, then why do we need to make a mess of that river? Why can't we? ensure that the industrial waste, normal waste, sewage is not indiscriminately put into the rivers to spoil their quality and tranquility of the rivers. So therefore, human activity has to be regulated and unauthorized activities must be stopped. Therefore, the restrictions carried out can go further without having to say that there is violation and nothing but violation of rights. Because violation of rights makes you realize that how important the right is and how very important it is to protect that right with regulations. So if you regulate and which will be the cause of a tremendous pressure on the society now because there has been stoppage of industrial activity, commercial activity, there has been you know economic loss, there have been projects. So it will also give rise to a lot of litigation during this period because of the breach of contract, non-performance and a lot of other things. So these are incidental to the restrictions that have been imposed but then you have to face them. There is no option or no choice out of that. Now, the right which I mentioned to you, right to life, the right to livelihood also is included by virtue of the judgment of Nanak Singh's case. That where do you say that even the right to life would include right to livelihood, though they are two different things. Of course, one is interlinked to another, but they are two different rights. So therefore, one of the serious questions that have been raised and the constitutional challenge has been raised is the right of the migrant labor to earn 
its livelihood and therefore right to live. If you don't have a right to livelihood, you obviously can't live. If you have nothing to eat, nothing to drink, where would you go? These are the few constitutional aspects which would come and now you have to see that there is some kind of a conflict between Article 19 and Article 21. If Article 21 is taken to a high pedestal of the bundle of rights constituted by process of judicial pronouncement, then Article 19 stands diluted to a great extent because the restrictions that you will impose must follow the scrutiny of law. 19 gives you an absolute priority right towards all your subjects which I have just mentioned. Now you will have to see the other aspect that what kind of principles are to be applied, you know, under our environmental jurisprudence, I must share with you that the progress of the environmental jurisprudence in our country has been probably fastest in the world. You know, by the Supreme Court of India, by the National Green Tribunal, High Court, it has been a very cumulative effort to protect the environment. And the three principles which have direct impact on good health and good environment is the precautionary principle, sustainable development, and polluter-based principles. These are the three fundamental principles of environmental jurisprudence which are to be taken care of. Now, if you see that what are the rights under the Constitution or to put it in other words, that what are the constitutional challenges that arise out of the present times? Firstly, is to put it as kind of a heading is the challenge, constitutional challenge to the freedoms granted under the fundamental rights of chapter three with the aid of Article 21 and the need of today's in the larger public interest to put restrictions. Now, what are the other ones in this, you will see. One is that once a restriction passes, the judicial scrutiny on the touchstone of the four principles or four items that I have mentioned to you, then still today you will have a question on right to livelihood is one of the challenges. Second is right to food, right to education. Then you will have the mass, you know, termination or dispensing the services of various people in the private or the public sector and particularly in the labor sector. Then you will also have a challenge. How would you handle the litigation which is going to arise? Because under the preamble to the Constitution, the Indian citizens are entitled to the social, political, and economic justice. It is not just justice simpliciter or the court justice system. It requires them even to have the need for a socio economic political justice. This concepts of whichever I mentioned to you just now 
are part and parcel of the socio-economic justice which the people of India should get it. The courts will have a lot of difficulty in dealing with the present situation. Let me tell you the Supreme Court, the High Court and even the District Courts are trying to have virtual hearing of cases as far as practical and possible. But to introduce technology in such a diverse country where the larger section of the society falls below the party line and the people cannot afford or there is no accessibility to such a technology that you can take access to justice. So another very fundamental issue challenge is access to justice and expeditious disposal to all. And for a class of people, it will be possible. But for the larger section, maybe it will not be so easily available and it will be difficult. The courts have interfered in the right and with the aim of protecting the rights of the people, asking the government to give a required medical aid, food aid, traveling aid and other incidental directions which may be necessary for proper satisfaction of the rights of citizens of this country. Now, we have to work greatly together and the current perspective or the way you should look at is again one thing which is a very fundamental environmental principle is doctrine of balancing. You know, you should have a reasonable approach, you should be able to balance things right conflict between right and restriction you should be able to balance it out on the touchstone of larger public interest rationality reasonableness and the competence of the people who are making the law well the question is that there has to be protection of rights. There should be a larger judicial tilt in favor of protection of rights. And they should not be given up easily. The rights available under the Constitution should be protected as far as possible. And they should not be given up. The why it is so is that if you will examine one of the you know, two things which I learned in this uh, one was that a professor from Harvard who said that we have invited the present COVID-19 affair because of our disrespect and interference with nature. The second was that, which was again from another person, a judge from Hawaii Supreme Court, who observed that the judges are also and be able to act as disaster management or disaster managers. Now, the question that really arises is that if we historically see that has these things ever happened earlier, well, certainly these things have happened earlier. I think maybe some of you were not even born when these things happened, but when we had the malaria, when we had earlier the infectious diseases happening, even in regard to Tihar J, the courts had passed directions and the stand of the administration for making a separate ward for checking the prisoners or the under trials who will enter to go through the medical checkup, restriction on movement, 
all was held to be proper because it served the larger interest. So this is nothing new. It is, has been happening across the globe and nowhere has been in any case a restriction which is unreasonable in such circumstances. Now you will have to also see that the international community while commenting on the present scenario has led into conscious thinking that the rights for the present can await their enforcement in absolute terms. The some countries declared medical emergency. When you declare medical emergency or accept such a prevalent circumstance in your country, the obvious effect is on social, economic, health and basic rights, including the right to life in terms of the Article 19 or Article 21. Let's look up the what kind of situation we are presently meeting. As you know that you know, lockdown you are facing, there is a restriction and regulation on tests of the COVID-19 or the coronavirus. Then hospital admissions, treatment, even there are difficulties people are facing in their day to day life. So it's an extraordinary state prevailing. It is not an ordinary state. Once extraordinary circumstances exist, the measures for handling such an issue and passing appropriate directions cannot be ordinary. They have to be with the aid of such legal tools that they are able to handle and provide due way to the extraordinary situation that is prevalent in the country today. Now, see, the problems we have is of very large magnitude. I don't know how many of you know that the waste generated in Delhi per day is more than 9,500 metric tons of waste. Now, you know, there was a time when you could find waste on the roads. There could be, you know, difficulty on driving. But then there is some better regulation. So we have to control the generation of waste as well as transportation and disposal of waste. Because we need to change our mindsets and realize that what is my contribution. See, no right exists without an obligation. Under the Constitution, which provides you the rights on the one hand, it also says the directive principles which obliges or poses a duty on the state government to take care of health, environment and improvement of such events. But what is most important is with regard to 
the constitutional duties stated on the citizens, the you also have duties under the constitution, which are constitutional duties to care for environment, to deal with all and make every effort to ensure that you do not waste the natural resources. You do not generate waste and let it that somebody else has to collect it and clear it. It is not my job. So this mindset must change and we must realize that to enjoy our rights under the constitution, we must do our duties under the constitution or the laws or the regulations which are in force in our country. You know, that is why the deficiency or inadequacy of natural resources is never been accepted. Our country is rich in its natural resources. You know, that is why Gandhiji had said that the earth has enough to meet the need of all, but not the greed of all. So you don't have to be greedy. What you have to do is there should be a direct proportionality between what you think is your right and what you believe is your duty. So unless and until your right and belief of duty go together hand in hand and you do socially good, do not think that there will be reduction in challenges. The challenges and difficulties would increase by the day. Let's go back to the UN Charter of Human Rights declared in 19, 10th of December 1948. That is where the root for human rights begins. If you see the extension of 21 by the Supreme Court in our country is primarily relatable to the human rights that have been given under that and then the subsequent international treaties, laws, agreements that have prevailed over from time to time that has brought into play the safety of the people with regard to health care. And one thing which I often say, and I would definitely like to share it with you also, is that the generations, particularly the young generation like you, have to take a call today. The call is that whether you want five star hospitals to treat you when you fall sick and you pay very heavily for that treatment, or would you choose to spend at the right hour on health care, on your environment, so that people don't fall sick. So this is a very crucial choice for the young generation today, because tomorrow people's representatives, bureaucrats, technocrats, or whatever. But the idea is that you have to think at this time whether you want a problem to be created and then solved or would you prevent the problem to be created so that no consequence of ill health and challenges there to follow. This has been a matter of concern, see, we do talk of climate change, we talk of, I don't know what, all on the environmental side. Now, one of the biggest worry today is the sea levels rising. You will be probably knowing it, and if you don't know, I will inform you that nearly, I think it is uh, 80 uh, billion pounds of plastic that is put into the sea every year by the people, us, 
the globe, the planet. Now, what is this contribution we are making? What is our right? Our right to have a clean environment and a good health is subjected to some regulations. So you should know that what you are doing to the nature and natural resources is going to flash back on you one day or the other. It is very important that the humanity as a whole on this planet should ensure that these problems do not repeat themselves. We should keep our environment resources with utmost care and apply the principle of sustainable development so that ultimately you don't get into on repeated costs by the, you know, what I hearing about is COVID-19 or similar such things which are required. We have to work it out that the challenges that COVID-19 has risen, they are not only constitutional, they are simple social problems. There are constitutional challenges, there are legal challenges, there are economic and social challenges. So we should be able to learn for a better tomorrow. Suffer unnecessarily and without proper rights, it is not possible for us to in any way cause impact on the utility of our living without being sure of our duties. I would only say that, you know, there is uh, one author, I really can't recollect his name, but he said a beautiful lines and I wish all of you remember that, that what he said was that the COVID-19 is a message of the God to the people on the planet that you are the occupants of this planet and not the owners of Earth. So we must always remember that our occupancy rights do not infringe the ultimate rights of nature and allied matters. Well, these are the few things I thought we could share and uh, the hope should be that this present pandemic ends at the earliest and we as a nation progress further and restore the economic or social losses that we have faced. And while thanking everybody, I wish all the attending students a very successful career and a good health, more importantly. Thank you so much. Thank you, Honorable, for enlightening us with your words of wisdom. Your Lordship, we have received many questions from the attendees. Due to paucity of time, we would request you to acknowledge a few of them. So, with your permission, I would like to present the question for you. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, the first question that is being asked by the attendee is, the spread of COVID-19 has affected the fundamental right of right to health. One of the disturbing results of this pandemic is people who are in need of regular medical checkup, such as cancer patients, are not able to go to the hospital, which violates their right to health. Do you think judiciary should come out and give proper direction to state for regular checkups of patients? See, uh, I don't think that courts would uh, normally exercise so much jurisdiction on these kind of affairs because presumption is that the state is acting fairly and the interest of all. But if somebody approaches the court 
And I am quite hopeful that appropriate directions would be issued. But I am told, as a matter of information, that the hospitals now are, in, in fact, inviting regular patients to come to the hospital and, uh, you know, with all precautions and protocol, medical protocol specified by Medical Council of India and other authorities, they are trying to obey. So I don't think it's an unsolvable issue. I don't think. Thanks, sir. So the next question that is being asked is, right to assembly is a fundamental right under Article 19, but the pandemic has put a restriction on it. States like Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, and Gujarat suspended the legal laws as well. People are not allowed to come out together and protest. Then how can a brief person get justice in such a situation? See, I told you that section, Article 19 is subject to restrictions. It's not an absolute right. If you will see the sub-clauses of the article, they clearly postulate that there is going to be restrictions. And test of restrictions, I've already informed you. Then if somebody goes to court, and I'm told that the courts have expressed to you that these restrictions are reasonable, and are in the larger public interest. So you cannot always say that, yes, my right must prevail. Whatever will happen to the public doesn't matter. So you yourself should have a realization. And I think that uh, gradually, I think this will be lifted. I think it's not going to be an kind of indefinite feature. Right, sir. Uh, so the next question is, closure of educational institutions violating right to education of students. However, some of the private educational institutions are providing virtual lectures. How can equality be attained in such a situation where poorer and students from remote areas do not have access to internet and mobile? Your view is? Yes, there you are right. I think that uh, I told you at the outset that even with regard to the judicial uh, decision-making process, there are difficulties of uh, reaching the remote places and even you know, most of the states, uh, everywhere the internet may not be available, mobile may not be available. So that's a practical difficulty. See, we are a developing country. We are not a developed country. So we have to keep that in mind. And, uh, you know, there has to be, I think, one of the good options out of this is if the you know the volunteers who can uh, help the people living in the remotes to have access to education or to sort of uh, have classes there but you know with uh, instead of educating you may be spreading uh, an infection to them so therefore you have to be very careful so, Maybe it's a matter of short time more and then things will be better. But yes, the question has a merit in it that yes, there is a difficulty which is resolvable. Thank you, sir. The next question is the unprecedented challenge posed by COVID 19 has strained the state center state relationships in India. It has reignited debates on cooperative federalism. Finance has been a major concern for the state during the fight with COVID-19. So your views on the current center state relationship? See, we should not forget that we are a country with federal constitution. And, you know, every state is has its own rights under the constitution as you know that there are three lists to the constitution which gives you powers of and legislative competence to deal with these things and that kind of a state of affair so the states have to exercise their own rights center has to exercise its own jurisdiction and rights so there can be the possibility of uh, you know, conflict cannot be ruled out. The framers of the constitution were aware about this, that there can be a conflict of uh, legislative competence, there can be conflict of uh, financial interest, economic interest, social interest. So they were quite aware about it, but that's our constitution and we are bound by the constitution. Let me tell you that our constitution is one of the best constitutions in the world. 
yes, this situation has created it. So it's, it's as good or as bad, you know, somebody falling sick in your house and you being, uh, you know, exhausted of the economic uh, means that you have. So it's nothing different. But the only thing is, it has affected people across the board. So it has become everybody's problem. And then a state and a national problem. So this is obviously we have to take out some major steps for economic development and restoration of social economic affairs. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the next question is the imbalance of power and the limitation of the state's welfare mechanism were all put into question when migrants walk for days on the highway and express ways of prosperous New India. Have we failed the equality visualized by this constitution? No, see, there has been a, a denial of uh, absolute right in terms of Article 21. I don't think there is any. Uh, two opinions about it. But yes, question is that maybe it could be handled a little better. I don't dispute that fact. But you know, it's always these things will fall short of expectations. Because expectations from a state are very high. And uh, performance in a given situation may not be so true. So I uh, feel that uh, yes, the people have suffered. There is uh, no doubt on that count. Yeah, maybe it could be done a little better. But you can't say that the state didn't make any effort. It did make an effort, but yes, it fell short of expectation of the people, which I think. And you know, then you have to, you know, we sh we should not forget one thing that you know, always asking the state a question is not the citizen's job. I mean, citizens must contribute their own. You know, there were people, there were organizations who were providing them food, they were you know, providing them medical help, they were trying to do something. They also had a restriction that they could, more than four people can't go, three people can't go. So therefore, it was you know, people could have uh, also gathered to help these people who needed nothing but help, right? nothing and certainly. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the next question is, as a lesson learned from COVID-19 pandemic and its consequences, is there a need to shape the Panchayati Raj institutions as an independent and equal chair of governance in India? So it's the constitutional spirit of bringing the governance to the grassroots level was to you know, empower the panchayats and the local bodies to and that is, I think, is doing fairly okay. I would say there is, you know, you needn't do uh, this COVID-19. You know, it's 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 a it's a pandemic. I mean, you can't, uh, you know, who can anticipate a pandemic to this level? That uh, the whole world will go, you know, totally topsy turvy, and the people will be in a great difficulty. So. These are extraordinary circumstances. I told you it's very difficult to deal with extraordinary circumstances by normal mechanism of law. You need some different laws. Thank you, sir. So the next question is, there have been questions on the constitutionality of Prime Minister judicial assistance and relief in emergency situations fund. How this fund is different from Prime Minister National Relief Fund and other state government funds? See, this is a. I have not frankly uh, gone through the constitution of these funds, and but I think they are primarily to serve a public cause. They are to serve, and I'm told that they are serving the various train funds, funds who are provided to people. And we, one should look into object of these things. You know, the content is uh, sort of immaterial. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so there's one more question. Yeah, what what are the constitutional challenges to ensure the right to life and right to equality guaranteed by the constitution in light of the Delhi government's order for treating Delhi domicile patients only? What are your views about this? 
I don't know if they have passed the direction that only Delhi purpose must be that you know people from the Delhi should get precedence in treatments because the Delhi government is responsible to treat its own people. That's why I told you that is the concept of federal structure. You will be more concerned with your state rather than you know people and uh, especially in view of the lockdown all over the country. I don't think this approach can be said to be wrong because uh, rest I don't know until some court uh, feels that it is very improper. But I think just to treat your people with some priority is uh, not uh, kind of, uh, it can be at best said to be a class discrimination which is permissible to some extent with some qualifications. So the next question is, as we have seen in the recent days, there have been cases where the hospitals have not admitted patients suffering from other chronic diseases due to various reasons. Does this violate your right to life and health care for your values? If they are being denied admission uh, for uh, no rhyme or reason, you know, if there are no beds in the hospital, you can't say anything about it. But if they have the amenities available and they deny it, to the people who are sick and uh, who needs medical assistance by admission and not by outpatient uh, care, then I think it's definitely denial of their right. I think there are judgments of the courts which said that uh, medical help should be provided. Thank you, sir. So, uh, right to speedy trial is our fundamental right, and it is said that justice delayed is justice denied. So do you think virtual court hearings have been uh, able to provide the justice on time? Yes, I think they have been able. So it, it's just definitely much better than no hearing. So the difference between the two is either you are heard or you are not heard at all. So you are being heard, cases are being decided. But as I told you, there is a very limited uh, class of our society which has accessibility to justice, virtual justice system. So therefore, there is a difficulty in their way, and I think efforts are being made to work it out. I think all courts are working on that. Uh, so there are few more questions, sir. If you permit, I'll ask you. Or we'll end all right, we'll add another five minutes, please. Five, seven minutes, and all right, sir. All right. I'll ask one more question. This will be our last question. Concerns arose regarding the right to privacy and the mandatory imposition of Arugi Setu app. What is your take on the concerns over privacy law back in India? You know, see, now this has been settled by the nine judges' bench. They have clearly spelled out what are the dimensions of the right to privacy and they have treated it as a fundamental right, which is a very, I think, very, very strong uh, judicial uh, pronouncement on right to privacy. So you have to examine each case within the ambit of that. Now, if again, See, there are late parameters. If those parameters are satisfied, there can be an exception to the right to privacy. Because right to privacy is also not an absolute right that nothing in this world can be done. So you have to work it out uh, you know, to a limited extent. And uh, like a right to freedom of expression to the press, you know, US has one policy, UK has another policy, India has another policy. In India, UK, the judicial process has given precedence over media trials. US feels that the freedom of press is superior. So, you know, these are constitutional approaches. It's very difficult to define. But I think if these people do not meet the parameters provided, courts will interfere. If they satisfy, the courts may not interfere. Okay. Thank you, Honorable. With this, we come to an end of this question answer session. Now I would like to invite Director of Sita Ratan International Business School, Professor Dr. B. S. Hoti sir, to extend his thanks to our esteemed guests. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. I extend my gratitude and thanks to our honorable speaker, Justice Sabdantra Kumar, who has been a significant and remarkable by enlightening participants with his expertise. The current pandemic situation is not only affecting the rights of the citizen, 
but have an impact on the constitutional structure of our country as well. Government has revamped their structure and functioning to face the problem posed by the pandemic. I'm sure that this webinar session is going to help all the participants to understand the constitutional challenges in this pandemic time. I extend my thanks to all the participants for being part of this webinar. I also extend my thanks to faculty members, students, and coordinators to make this event into a real success. Thank you all. Thank you, Your Lordship, for graciously accepting our request. We as audience have greatly benefited from the session. Honorable, we as beneficiaries are indebted to you. Thank you to the audience for joining us and being patient listeners throughout the session. We look forward to hosting you again. With this, I declare the session closed. Thank you, Chen. Mm -hmm.